fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCL 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery and a mysterious world we're in. And of course, I'm Al Warren. Uh, Joe Goldberg is co hosting on this one today. Hello, sir. Hope you're doing well. Well, you know, I'm surviving. It's been three weeks. I still can't smell and uh, taste very much, but there you go. You'll you'll get better. We all hope. (laughs) But you do smell. I don't even touch it. I couldn't couldn't let it go. I couldn't let it go. You do smell. Oh, no. Well, I can't smell. I can't smell it if I am. So there you go. That's true. You know? I even tried the really loud, loud colognes just to make sure and still nothing. So I don't know. Maybe it's a good thing. Yeah. The people around, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Well, today we're talking about thriller and mystery, detective, action, all that stuff. And we've got a writer. His uh, latest book is called Racing the Light. And it's an Elvis Cole and Joe Pike novel. And it's number 19 in the series. Wow. So, uh, Mr. Robert Crace, thank you for being here. Uh, it's it's terrific uh, to be here. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, first thing, you, you've written a lot of books. Now, and I don't know you started. I guess you started in more of a writing uh, in in the TV career, like you were doing what Cagney and Lacey and and shows like that. Um, what made you decide to jump over into doing a novel rather than TV writing? I have um, always wanted to write novels. And before I wrote television, uh, I started writing short stories. And um, um, that was my, you know, my babyhood as a, as a writer. Uh, so I, I have a long history with prose. And then I got into television. I, I very much wanted to write TV and films. Um, and I, I worked for about 10 or 12 years exclusively in television, had the opportunity to work on some just fabulous series like Hill Street Blues, Cagney and Lacey, Miami Vice, on and on. Um, But after a while, um, you know, the original dream returned. I I wanted to go back to my roots. Uh, I wanted to create my own detective character because I was a huge fan of of, um, crime fiction. Um, And so I did. I I transitioned myself out of television. All my TV friends thought I was crazy. Uh, and, and, and set about teaching myself to write novels and eventually published my first book, which was The Monkey's Raincoat. So you did short stories and then you did television and now you're doing books. And the, and the obvious question is, what's the difference in the process and the way you write them? It's a sing short stories to television, broad te- which, is a, which is a group of people. Mostly. Right. And then- Though they, there's a lot of similarity, of course, the three distinct mediums um, and, and art forms. Uh, you know, short stories and novels are both prose, so, you know, it requires a, a certain um, artistry with the language. Television also requires an artistry with the language, but it's visual. In working in television, though, it's completely different because it's it's a collaborative process. You know, in, in if you're writing a te- on a television series the way I did, a staff writer, a story editor, executive story consultant, producer, executive producer, all these different titles that, that we we have when we do that, uh, you're in the writer's room. So there's going to be multiple writers in there, a few producers in there. Sometimes it's a big crowd and all of you have to work together in some way because it's collaboration. Now that can be wonderful. And a lot of terrific uh, television gets made that way, but I found it wearing after a while. And I wanted, uh, I wanted to express my own voice, which really isn't possible in a group effort. You know, it's, it's, it's the group effort that, that makes it to the screen. 
So the appeal to me was, was I'm going to create my characters, bring them to the page my way. And uh, people are either going to like it or they're not going to like it, but it's going to be mine. And and to this day, and now that I've I, I I I'm a novelist, I write novels for a living. To me, it feels like being I'm Walt Disney, and the books are my Disneyland. I I, I get to do whatever I want, um, and and that's a great creative joy. Plus, I I would guess that in television script writing for some of these series because it's like an hour-long show things are a little bit more formula well they are formula to to a degree and um uh and they're short you know it's it's typically an, a one-hour episode of television these days is, is probably um i'm gonna guess so anywhere between 48 52 pages to make an hour uh, as opposed to a novel is going to be one of my novels is, is probably going to be 480 to 520 manuscript pages. So you know, novels are a long-term project. When I was working in television and we were under, um, we were in production and, and, and under pressure, you know, I, I would write a 60 page script uh, in, in three or four days. Um, a couple of times I, I even wrote them for shorter periods of time than that. You can't do that with a novel, you know. When with, if it, you you set about writing a novel and you're in it for the for the long haul, you living with it for for the better part of a year. So it's a major major commitment. Requires much more focus. And it's it's much more complex to write. When you when you started this series um, with Elvis Cole and Joe Pike, um, so you're at book one and you're starting this. Did you kind of know in your mind that this was going to turn into like 19 books? Or was it? It's this sort of a totally play as you go each time you do a book. Clueless, never uh, would have even dreamt it would become what it became. Honestly, the first novel I, I wrote, I had to write two novels before I wrote *The Monkey's Raincoat*, because I was teaching myself how to write a novel. Um, so after I left TV, I took a year off from TV. Uh, and, 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 and wrote a book, and it was just awful, terrible. Um, and then I wrote another book, and it was just terrible. I mean, so bad, I, I didn't bother to show it to any, anyone else. And I had to regroup and then figure out how to actually write a complete manuscript that worked, that, that did what I wanted to do. And at that point in my life and career, remember, I'd never done it. Uh, I was trying to to solve the puzzle of doing it, and and you know you ask now, oh, did you think there'd be nineteen? I was actually my goal was simply to write a complete book that wasn't too embarrassing. That was that was it. I, I just wanted to write a complete story that I enjoyed writing. That you know I thought, oh, please, maybe, please, I could sell this somewhere, anywhere, and I I didn't think. I didn't think beyond that. It never occurred to me that uh, Elvis Cole would become as popular as 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 he became, or uh, that that so many people would would uh, would be my readers. So, what was so wrong with those first two novels you wrote that uh, you say like one they're so awful you didn't even show anybody, and the first one was pretty awful? So, what what about it? What, that did you find that you were missing, or what was what was the the hard thing to get going? Remember, I was coming out of uh, was ten years of, of working in, in television, and during that time, um, I think I developed a sense that well, I knew this for a fact that you know the, the outside world, meaning everyone out there in, in the in the greater world who wasn't involved with making the sausage, as it were, there there was a kind of a disdain by the by the literary establishment for TV writers. Uh, that, that that somehow television work was hack work, right? It was junk. The way we we wrote TV, uh, and they still do, it is um, you know it, it, a television episode or a movie. All the scenes, uh, the action, everything's figured out beforehand. It's it's uh, someone comes up with the concept for a story, has to pitch that story to a buyer, producer, whoever. Um, then an outline is written. 
And then finally, if, if the outline is approved with some changes, no doubt, uh, a script is written. So it's all very, there's, there's, a, there's a paint by the numbers aspect to it. Now I say that, and, and of course, you know, the mechanics of it are still true today, but you know, marvelous, beautiful, wonderful, creative stories are written that way too. But so I was coming out of TV and I thought I had, I had managed to convince myself that, okay, I, I, all this script work that I've done, obviously it, there, there's an element of hack work to it because I'd figured everything out. I'd outlined, that's the way we did things. So I convinced myself that a true artist, a, a, a true artist doesn't write like that. A true artist just sort of sits down at the typewriter with, with a, a, a blank page and you're, you know, you're, you're, you go into a sort of a trance like state, your eyes roll back in your head and you, you start to type and type and type and it just, the story just comes out. And then finally, when you come out of your fugue state, you've typed the end and here's this wonderful story. So when I wrote the first book, I, I said, I'm not going to outline, figure things out the way I've been doing for 10 years with TV work. I'm just going to sit down, blank page, start writing and see what happens. Well, what happened was I wrote a 550-page manuscript. I had a 500-page beginning and a 50-page ending and no middle. It, it was just, there was just, there was no structure to it. There was nothing. Uh, that, that was me making it up um, as I went. So I wrote a second book, and exactly the same thing happened. And after the second strikeout, I said, you know, Bob, you should go back to what you know works. You know, if it's good enough for Hill Street Blues and Cagney and Lacey and, and Miami Vice, let's let's apply that to writing a book. So that was the book that became The Monkey's Raincoat, where I I I did the writing the way I knew how to do the writing. And uh, damned if it didn't work. So what's your writing structure now like? Or, so you actually totally outline uh, the book? Yes. Beforehand. beforehand and and so how do you and how do you actually decide how you're going to do this and i mean this in the way of like okay so do you set aside you know nine to five five days a week and you sit and write at those hours or do you have to have a certain mood in order to write like how's your how's your let's say your way of doing it well first i have to be sober <laughs> you know, you, always a good start. <laughs> this is a good start. Yeah. Um, no, it, I, I'm a professional writer. I don't sit around and wait for inspiration. Uh, the muse. If I, you know, I, I can sit there forever. The muse. The muse is on the beach in Maui working on her tan. I mean, she's. You know, I'm very rigorous and disciplined. I, I and I guess that was a gift from my television days. Also, when it's time to write, you. Go, on your room, you sit down and and you write. Now, let me be clear. That doesn't mean you 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 sit down and you immediately start typing out the narrative and you know three thousand words later you get up into the day. Whatever the the whatever it takes you to get those words on the page. The important thing and the disciplined thing is you must sit there and try to do it. And I do. I do it every day. Uh, um, I write every day. I, you know, the, I mean, the hours per day vary, uh, but I but I write every day because it's it's a job. It's I, I'll, by the way, I have to say also, I love to do it. You know, it it it, it beats many other choices I could make. So I, I enjoy being in this room where I am now, sitting at my desk, and working, thinking, coming up with characters and funny things and exciting things and dangerous things and whatever it is. Again, it's 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 that sort of inner landscape that's my Disneyland, and I get to play in it. What I mean by outlining, just as an example, and they vary. My books vary in, in the time they take. But let's just say it takes a year to write a book. So probably the first four months of that uh, is, is me outlining. And, and outlining to me doesn't mean I sit down with a pad and I write, okay, put the number one dash, chapter one. You know, woman walks into Elvis's office and hires him. Two, chapter two. Uh, Elvis gets up uh, and, and drives across the city to interview somebody. It's not like that. The first for me is always the characters. I don't have a story unless I have that character who drives the story, that person who I want to write about. And, and sometimes in a specific story, that'll be Elvis Cole. 
or sometimes it'll be his partner, Joe Pike, or sometimes it'll be, I refer to them as guest characters, but it'll be the, the main driving force character who Elvis meets or who hires Elvis or, or whatever. And, and they have a story that I find so compelling that I want to spend the next year of my life with them. And once I have that character, the character actually will give me a direction for the story. Like, what kind of jam are they going to be in? What's going to be their problem? And then I start spitballing other characters. Uh, and then I come up with scene ideas and story ideas. And by the way, none of this is linear. During that four-month period, at the, certainly at the beginning, I actually think of it as kind of global. It could go, it could fit anywhere. And I'm writing all this stuff down, right? I'm, I'm keeping notes. Um, I, I, I sit at my laptop or sometimes my pad with a, with a pen, um, and I'm jotting down all these gazillions of ideas, the majority of which will never make it in the book. But little by little, the scenes come together, and the story arc comes together. And, yes, sometimes you've got to roll up your, your sleeves and really you know, grind it, try to work it. Oh, man, that's not working. How can I do this other thing? But probably by the end of the four months, I have pretty much the beginning, the middle, and the end of the book. I know the ending. Um, I may not know absolutely everything, right? There's going to be a lot of details I don't know. There will be the missing scene, a lot of details, a lot of details I don't know. They come in the writing. I reach a place where I love the story of that character and the book, and I, f I feel it's exciting and important enough for me to spend all this time with it. And, and, and I'm confident that I'm going to be able to write the book that I want to write. Uh, and that's when I actually start typing narrative. Well, that's actually one of my traditional questions, and it's just a great answer. When you're writing a series, so you're going from book to book, and you're saying, how is uh, Elvis or Joe going to change in this book? Uh, what character things do I want to bring out? And then you fit the plot to make that those changes happen? Am I... Am I getting close? You are getting close. You're, you're getting close. O oftentimes, the, uh, the plot grows out of that change that comes to you. Racing the Light is a story of a young man who's trying to prove his worth. Now, it's more complicated than that, but that'll serve. He's trying to prove his worth, his value, both to himself, to the society at large, and most of all, to his father, his parents. Now, if I have that much, if I have that much, I can see a world of scenes that would serve that in, both not only for that character, uh, the types of scenes he would be in, what I would have to, what I would have to depict for the reader in order to tell his story. But I also can see how Elvis Cole fits into it. Uh, my hero, the detective, who ends up because of the nature of this beast being the hero and the savior, of course, for this, this young man who's trying to, who's, who's trying to uh, uh, reach his goal, who's trying to prove himself. You know, that's the nature of my guys, my detectives. You know, the, so it, it ends up, once I have that big hook, once I have the emotional thrust, and it's all about emotions for me, it really is, all of the books, every one of them. Once I have that hook, the rest, most of it, begins to lay itself out for me very, very easily. It's been that way for all the books. How do you experience your your uh, main uh, characters? Like, for instance, Elvis. Uh, is this something that you uh, experience like a movie or voices or... You mean in my head? Yeah. Like, what's your experience? Um, I, it's, it's weird. I, it's, by the way, not just Elvis. This would apply to all my characters. I am in their heads. Well, at the same time, concurrently, simultaneously, I'm, I'm in their heads and I'm an omniscient uh, presence outside of them, watching and directing what they do. Um, it, you know, it isn't, it isn't uh, you know, Elvis Cole comes alive and now he just writes the scene for me. I know a lot of writers who say that, but I mean, I understand, and this happens to me too, you're, like you're into a scene you know, like you're on, right? You're in it. And dialogue is flowing and the interaction is flowing. Um, and it can feel like the characters, you know, now they have a life of their own and they're, and they're doing it without you. But, of course, in reality, they're not doing it 
with, without you. You, know, you, you the writer, but you're directing. You're directing that. But I, again, concurrently, I'm feeling everything they feel. Uh, you know, if if and this happens often for me, there, there's a lot of emotion in my novels, and um, in every no- novel, I have a scene that that leaves people crying. Um, well, when I'm writing that scene, sitting here, right here, uh, I'll be crying too. You know, it's 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 a very heartfelt moment. I mean, I have to be with them. I have to be. If they're feeling something that deeply, I don't. I can't write it unless I'm there, experience it also. So, um, uh, you know, again, that's all. That's all part of the process. But that's what happens. Robert, I like your comment on emotion, and. In your books, I get a sense that there's sort of this, I don't know if it's a good versus bad, crusade against injustice or a crusade for justice. But, you, know, you, you mentioned the guy's trying to prove himself to his father. Am I off seeing that in that crusading aspect of your of your books, of this search for justice, good versus bad type of feeling? Yeah, of course. Yes. It's it's I, I guess I have recurring themes in in my books. And, and uh, you know, one is the importance of a family unit, uh, whether we're t- talking, you know, spouses and children or, or just a group like Elvis and Joe, uh, you know, they, they form a family unit of two. And but I justice is since book one, what Elvis delivers. Elvis is not a police officer. He is Joe. Uh, he's a private investigator. And I, uh, he's not there when he's solving one of his cases and bringing a bad guy to justice. He, he's not there to follow black letter law and build a case for a district attorney. Elvis is delivering justice for whoever his client is, who's being wronged in some way. And, and so that recurs for me again and again and again. Um, he leads with his heart. And if someone is being unfairly treated or abused or victimized, that's the true crime that that Elvis is is solving. So again, it's it, that thing is that 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 is something that's very important to me, and makes very Elvis, I think, very heroic. And I do think of these novels. Uh, well, I think of them in many ways, but I do think of these no- novels as heroic fiction. Elvis is the protagonist. Elvis is the hero. Doesn't mean he's without fault. He breaks the law all the time. But he's someone who believes in doing right. And he has a very, um, very well-defined sense of what's right and just. When, when you have so much emotion that's involved in these characters yourself, uh, do you find it difficult to write people that are or characters that are evil or bad or doing awful things. I mean, because I, I would say that it probably uh, coincides that you would also feel that emotion as well. No, I, I, I do. My bad guys are part me too. I have this saying that all writers are cannibals. You cannibalize your life, your experiences, bits and pieces of, of yourself, and you you transmogrify them into your characters. Um, I, I love writing my bad guys. I, I find my bad guys in the main great fun to write because they allow me to touch the dark side. I, I do so with a, with a distance uh, because, of course, I don't want to be that person. But it is um, artistically enormous fun to, to create bad guys who are horrible, but at the same time um, delicious. And, you know, what I mean by delicious is, is that they're interesting and entertaining and fun for the, for the reader, no matter how you know, evil they are. Uh, you know, they're, they're serving a purpose in the story. And one of those purposes is entertaining the reader. So as you're creating your hero story with your bad guys, are you thinking about how your fans, your audience, your readers are responding to this world that you've created? Is, or you're, you're writing for yourself. You're writing for your reader. I, I, I'm writing. I'm writing for me. See, I'm my first reader. My philosophy since beginning of the first, the very first book 
the first Elvis Cole book, and everyone now is right. I used to have a sign, and I don't have it. I don't have a sign in my office anymore. Write the book you want to read, um, and that's what I've tried to do. Every one of my books, I'm writing it because I'm the reader. I'm the first reader. Um, I don't think of my readers in the larger sense. You know, of course, I'm writing. I, I'm thinking to myself sometimes, gee, I really hope they like it or, you know, this, this, I think they'll like this. But I, I don't um, edit myself to that end. I edit myself to my reading experience. So in, in, in a way, I guess it's my good fortune that, that, that so many people, obviously, so many people share my taste on reading because, because they're, they're drawn to Elvis and Joe. I, I try not to guess what's going to be successful with people. I don't, I don't, I don't write to that end. I never have. I don't try to concoct. To me, that would be like trying to pick stocks, right? Like which stock should I buy? I know nothing about stocks. If, if, if I, if I tried to live that way, um, I, I'd be broke. And and I think me trying to anticipate what readers are going to like or respond to outside of very, very small, narrow parameters, it would probably be a loser for me. So I, I just write the stories I enjoy writing. So when you when you say um, you like your characters or the story to be heroic, um, is that kind of your subtext? Like, do you, do you intentionally put a subtext underneath the story and the entertainment, or maybe one comes... Uh, out organically there's always a subtext it comes organically but uh again like theme my my subtext the things i i use as a foundation i seem to recur you know for example and I, and i'm i'm very conscious of this when i write if El, if i do a scene with elvis uh elvis cole and his uh estranged girlfriend um lucy chenier because they've been estranged, estranged for you know ten books now or whatever it is. If 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 I have a, a scene with them, the subtext for that scene is always from Elvis's point of view. What it is is he he wants to be with her. He loves her, even though they're estranged. She is her her choice to move away. Her choice is the reason they're not together. He's hanging in. He's been hanging in for years. That love for her forms his subtext. Uh, I'll give you another example. It doesn't have anything to do. If Elvis is, uh, for example, talking to a critical parent about his son, the subtext of that scene, whether Elvis actually says the words in dialogue or not, is that Elvis actually is, is seeing the flaw in, in the parent, in that particular parent. And though he may not say it, the unfairness of the criticality imbues all his words. You know, it, so there's, for me, there's always a, a, a subtext to what I'm writing. And it's usually serious. Even when I write funny scenes, it's, it's again, because it, it harkens back to the emotionality of what I'm doing. I write for the emotions. Yeah, the books have a lot of action. Yeah, there's lots of funny stuff. Uh, the guys are very physical. There's a lot of, you know, gunplay. But really what keeps me going isn't all that stuff. What keeps me going is those emotional moments um, where, where I'm the most in touch with my feelings through those characters. And all of those scenes have, have some kind of subtext. Well, I guess as you get through each book, um, going through the emotion and the writing of each book, um, by 19 now, um, you must have changed a lot from book one to book 19. Yes. Um, I wonder if you go back and look at uh, book one or two and think about rewriting it. <laughs> I, uh, uh, there's a dangerous problem I have. I recently, the past, uh, since the pandemic broke, this has been this past three years, I've had occasion to go back and reread five or six of my novels. The earlier books, because uh, uh, honestly, I forget what's in them. So, uh, I, you know, my readers who come to my signings, they know my books way better than I do. They ask me questions about things. I got no idea what they're talking about, right? Because I don't remember. But so I, I reread these books and uh, I, I, I just knew this about myself anyway. It's true. I really want to rewrite everything. 
I I could go back to any of the books and just as I read it, have my blue pen and I could just make changes. That's not to say that, that what I wrote was, was, uh, needed more editing. I think that's just my personality. I do, uh, I, I do go back. I would change things. So it's probably best that I cannot do that. It would be an endless process. It would. And I'd never write any new books. I'd be, you know, here's, here's the, uh, Here's you know, the monkey's raincoat, uh, part seventeen. But Robert, the, the, you know, there's nineteen books there. You, you know, you know, was it the late eighties? Was somewhere we started about these things? Nineteen eighty-seven. Yeah. So, I mean, you're younger. You've changed a lot. You know, your characters have changed. How have you incorporated the sort of your maturity into the characters in your book and in your books as you yourself have changed? Right. I I think. Um, in a, in a couple of different ways. Yes, both the characters and I have changed. I'm not the same person I was uh, when I wrote The Monkey's Raincoat in the mid-'80s. I probably, if I were writing it from scratch today, uh, there would be – well, it would be completely different. But one of the one of the reasons I've been able to sustain 19 books is the fact that I've changed and the fact that I see the world – through different eyes has allowed the characters to stay fresh for me. And I've, and I've uh, uh, incorporated those differences into the, into the books. Elvis, though still funny. Uh, there's still funny scenes in my books. I don't think Elvis is quite as the books were way more. The earlier books were much, much more jokey. Now uh, though, Elvis is still quick with a one liner. Um, I still write funny scenes. There's a hilarious scene in, 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 in a character in Racing the Light that I absolutely loved writing uh, because he's funny. I use him for, for laugh relief. But the earlier books, a couple of which I just reread recently, um, it was almost like there had to be something funny in every paragraph. I don't do that anymore. I also learned... You know, Elvis, because of the nature of his job, because of the kind of jobs that he that he takes, there are some topics and subjects, some situations where his humor is inappropriate. Uh, you know, to make to make light of or jokes about a certain thing. Uh, maybe I would have written that in 1990, but now if I were going to write it, I would think that just makes Elvis an asshole. You know, he 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 just wouldn't, shouldn't do that. Um, I can, I can be funny the next chapter, right? In, in the following chapter, I'll be funny. But in this chapter, in this scene, he needs to be more thoughtful and, and respectful. So it's, as I change, he's changed. It, it, it's, it's inevitable. And I'm sure if I'm still around and writing, you know, 10 books from now, uh, we'll, we'll both be different still. Here's though, he's got a great advantage over me though. Uh, when I started writing these things, Elvis was a few years older than me. So now we're on book 19. Elvis is a lot younger than me. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. You slowed down the time. I did. And, you know, space time continuing in your books. He did. He, Elvis, I just didn't want him to age. I, I, I considered it on and off earlier, like in the first third of my career, but I realized, uh, that that wasn't going to work for me and the characters. So I, Elvis doesn't actually live in, in Los Angeles, where I live. Elvis lives in Elvis Cole's Los Angeles, which is sort of like a parallel universe. And, and the great, I wish I lived there because the great thing about it is he doesn't age as fast as me. You know, he's, he doesn't have bad knees and bad ankles and bad back and, and, and all those things. And I get constantly called on it by, by my readers because I, Unfortunately for myself, but I, I say unfortunately, I, it, it was right. You know, Elvis is sort of anchored in time by the Vietnam War, right? Because I made a, you know, the, the, that's Elvis and Joe were both in Vietnam, which would make him, what, in his 70s now. Um, I, uh, somewhere in the mid realm of, of my books to date, I just decided uh, I, I can't have him be that age. I, I like the physicality of the guys. I like their attitudes. Uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to 
right scenes where, where you know, Elvis's sciatica is acting up. Um, <laughs> believe me, the, you know, I, I, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to curse him with that. So uh, he, he's just, he's younger. It's fiction. You have to be careful with um, where you place your humor in the book. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, as as I said, I'm um, I'm much more conscious of of that uh, these days than when I first began. Um, I mean, I, I'm I, I like being funny. There's still a lot of humor in the books, but I'm very careful in my effort to not be inappropriate or insensitive with his humor. Not only his humor, but you know, I, then I have other funny characters uh, who who. Uh, I love to write because I like writing that. But I, I, I try to be very cognizant of that these days. But but isn't that kind of a difficult thing to do? Because like you were saying, when you're writing something in the 80s, later 80s, what's appropriate then when you were writing and what was kind of funny is maybe not something that would be today. So even even when you're writing something today, isn't that kind of something you foresee happening in the future with something? Well, you know, uh, the, all you can do is live in the present world and react uh, to the present world. The uh, I mean, I don't I don't know how things are going to be uh, ten or twenty years from now. Um, so the choices I make today when I'm writing. Um, you know, th those choices are being made with by a man with my sensibilities today because I live in today's world. And I grew up having the experiences that I've had up to this point in time. I, I'll give you a, actually a perfect example. We were going back to the monkey's raincoat again. Um, and something I did then and would not do now. In the, in the monkey's raincoat, which briefly is uh, a mousy uh, with – uh, a nervous woman named Ellen Lang hires Elvis Cole to find her uh, missing husband, Mort Lang, who's an agent. So Elvis takes the job and and um, sets about finding Mort and uncovers some really dark, shady, dangerous stuff. And Ellen ends up, Ellen and her children end up threatened, and Ellen ends up kidnapped, and all kind of horrible things happen. So there's a scene um, where Elvis uh, and and I you know yeah this is a spoiler but you know it was published in 1987 if you haven't read it by now pfft, read the clip notes <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, skip it skip it just skip it it doesn't matter so Elvis rescues her and then they go back to uh, Elvis Elvis's place as a frame in Laurel Canyon and you know they're shattered. Uh, Ellen's shattered because she has to put her life back together. It's this big emotional, uh, she's at this uh, huge emotional turning point in, uh, in her life. And, you know, it's just the two of them and it's, and it's late and, and she touches him because she wants, you know, to be comforted. And then she and Elvis make love. And, you know, now I think I, I simply wouldn't have it. it, it I wouldn't do it. Um, it was, it was honest and I thought emotionally pure because it was sincere on both their parts. When I wrote it, uh, I thought it was emotionally pure, but now I think it's a bad choice. It's a bad decision. She was, even though she touched him, she was in too much of a weakened state. He stood of, he should have been stronger. It would have been all right for him to hold her, comforting her, but for them to go to bed, is is a uh, is a scene that I uh, I now regret. So that's an example. You know, that's now it's what thirty something, however many years it is uh, since Monkey. And so when I write, when I write any of my books now, you know, whether it's Race and Light, Dangerous Man, all all the more recent books, uh, I'm writing. The guy writing them has the sensibility he has now. So there are choices that I would make that are different than earlier choices. Well, I want to ask the normal question was always important to me. That's why I ask it is, is inspiration, you know, sort of the why people write. I mean, you're a Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler guy, and so am I. It, it just oozes that. And then, and they were written in their time frame too. Sure. Right? Yes. Those books couldn't be written now. Uh, 
So what else do, do you read outside the genre? You do nonfiction or lit fiction to get inspiration or just to clear your mind? Yeah, well, I, I not just to clear, I, I do. I'm a very eclectic reader and always have been. Uh, I, I, I read a lot of crime fiction for sure, different subgenres uh, within the world of crime fiction. But I also read, uh, again, eclectically. I read, all, I read science fiction. I read uh, literary fiction. Um, you know, pretty much anything that looks interesting to me, uh, uh, I I read, and I actually encourage. You know, whenever I talk to to aspiring writers or, 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 or younger writers, uh, I encourage them to to do it um, because I think it, it you can learn from anywhere, especially if you want to be a writer. But more than learning, I think it's it's important to have a a diversity of taste. Uh, you know, to 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 seek out what's good and interesting across an entire palette of colors. And uh, I, I think it makes for, if you're going to look at it purely practical terms, it makes for richer writing when, when you write. Uh, but it's also fun for me because I enjoy it. Does that go for movies too? Is that like Chinatown? And uh... Yeah. I mean, I, I watch, uh, uh, again, I'm not limited to crime movies. I mean, I, 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 I watch a lot, of, of course, a lot of crime movies. But and TV shows, but uh, I'm just as likely to uh, Game of Thrones or comedies or you know whatever. I just watch if it's good. I want to watch it. If it's interesting to me, I, I want to watch it. It's all grist for the mill, man. You know, it's, right? Exactly. <laughs> especially as you as you hone uh, the task of writing into a narrower, um, narrower, narrower, narrower point. You know, if if if, if I'm going to write a scene between two men standing um, on an empty street, period. If that's the task, you can get great, you can get have, experience great examples and hence models for your own work by reading anything. I mean, that might appear in, um, um, you know, in a, in a romance novel, might appear in a science fiction novel, might appear in a, in a, in a, in a, in a spy thriller, might appear in uh you know, literary novel, wherever. I mean, feed it. The, the, the trough is wide. Indulge yourself. What's next? Book 20? Uh, well, I, I am writing uh, the 20th Elvis Cole novel. Yeah, I already started it started uh, a few months ago. Um, and uh, so the next book, which uh, will be the 20th Elvis Cole novel, is already in works. No, I can't tell you about it. So you're in research phase because you always do the big research early. Is that, uh, am I wrong on that? Well, I did the research phase already, and uh, and most of the plotting is done. And I've actually started to write scenes on it, so I'm I'm well underway. So now let's um, find out how to contact Robert. Uh, do you guys do you do social media website? What is your favorite contact? locations um uh, well i'm on uh, twitter at robert crace i'm on uh, instagram at robert crace and i'm on facebook at uh, the real robert crace oh there's a fake one out there <laughs> there must be <laughs> do you run a website or not uh yeah robertcrace.com sorry oh, yes okay. i have that too i got i got oh. i'm covered you're covered well we'll have all that up on our website as well so people can find you with one click Easy, excellent you know, listening, and that. So, well, that's fascinating. Um, how was it? Did, did the pandemic get in the way of any of your writing? Because this one coming out November first, Terry, you must have been doing a lot of it over the crazy time. And 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 I asked that in a sense of um, there was a lot of emotion and uh, anger. Let's say feelings kind of all over the place with the last couple of years for a lot of different reasons. And I wonder if that um, interferes with your writing or does it get into your writing somehow? The, the, the pandemic crushed me. I have writer friends who, who literally were saying things like this to me, man, this pandemic is great. I'm going to have two books out this year. I might even have three books out this year for me, exactly the opposite. When, when the uh, pandemic uh, peer broke in the big news uh, in January of, 20, of 2020, um, I just literally stopped. 
I mean, I, I, it was like I woke up in a bad 70s dystopian science fiction movie of the week. And I, oh, Michael Crichton, don't do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I just had the TV on all day. I was just glued to the set. Um, and I don't know what sort of, I don't know what sort of perverse, morbid interest I had in it, but it actually felt to me like suddenly uh, we had gone from the real world into this weird science fiction world. So I I probably didn't do anything for six or eight months. Um, there are a lot of other things at play too, but that I, I was just totally T-boned right off the rails. Um, and lost track of everything I was doing. And then when you add in, a lot of other crazy things were happening. And, and, and those things fed into uh, racing the light. Um, in fact, you know, I, before um, the pandemic, I had been working, and this is before A Dangerous Man um, came out. Uh, I had already started on what was going to be the next Elvis Cole book. And when the pandemic and, and and the world went upside down for a lot of reasons. I actually, when I tried to get back to work, I could not pick up the thread on that other book. I just lost whatever connection I felt. Um, and Raising the Light literally came out of the massive uh, chaos and emotional chaos and loss of trust uh, that was happening in the world all through that period from conflicting news reports about COVID, you know, where'd it come from? Was it manufactured? Is it natural? Can we cure it? Are we all going to die? Lockdowns? No lockdowns? Clashing messages from everyone. You know, you, you couldn't trust anything you were hearing on the news and into this maelstrom, the United, of all people, the United States Navy, the official United States Navy drops all these videos of unidentified flying objects that F-18 <laughs> pilots were taking pictures of. And like, you, you like, you have to do a double check, take, and you're looking at TV, like, what? Excuse me? And then they've never explained it. You know, now we got congressional hearings about it. And like, what? Well, we don't know what they are, but there they are, and our pilots are seeing them. Here in L.A., where we have city councilmen, council members uh, running our city, like one after another, indicted for corruption, indicted for corruption. There was so much lying in the world, so much loss of trust in the world, that all of that uh, led to uh, or went into racing the light, wait, wait, went into uh, my character, Josh Schumacher, um, the podcaster in, uh, in, in, in Racing the Light, uh, because Josh is, is, is a warrior for truth. Um, and I think the pandemic and all the other craziness directly led to me creating the characters in Racing the Light and Racing the Light. And, um, um, so if anything good came out of it, at least I got this book out of it because it, it uh, that's what I'm writing about. What's true? What isn't true? Who are the people who are lying to us? And someone needs to expose those people. And and that would be Elvis Cole and Josh Schumacher. Well, that's too bad they weren't here in real in the real world. <laughs> we could use them. <laughs> yeah, we could use them. Please. Well, this has been a real pleasure talking to you. Um, of course, everyone, get out and get this book. It's the new Elvis Cole book, uh, Racing the Light. And it's Robert Crace. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Joe. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www houseofmystery.com Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.